Okay, well, I have 2 o'clock on the nose, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Wanted to welcome everybody to today's uh, Q&A with the State Survey Agency. I'm Marcy Gallagher with Mountain Pacific Quality Health. So just a couple quick uh, housekeeping items. This meeting is being recorded. And since, all, since the meeting is being recorded, all lines have been placed on mute to eliminate any background noise. At any time during the presentation, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions. If you're using Zoom, you can click on the microphone icon next to your name in the participant list or in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen to mute or unmute your audio. For those using your phone line, you can use the star key in the number six. So uh, six, star six to mute and to unmute your line. So again, that's star six to mute and unmute. And if you're logged on to Zoom, you can also use the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. So you can use chat as well to ask a question. And um, Todd, I will just turn it over to you. So thank you. All right. Can you hear me? I can hear you. OK, great. Um, I, I won't be monitoring the chat box. So if somebody could let me know that as we go through it, if we have questions or. I can do that, Todd. No problem. Thank you. OK, well, welcome, everyone. Um, I've got a, with me today is uh, Tina Smith as well, who's going to present some of this to you today, but we're going to try to give you some updates on what we know for the current situation and then answer any questions you may have as well, specifically. Um, the only question we did receive, and I, I guess I'll get to that um, in a little bit, but I wanted to first cover um, for us, uh, our commitments as the Certification Bureau, our team commitments are public pr protection. As you know, uh, we're here to you know review and, and oversee long-term care, hospitals, hospice, home health, a variety of providers throughout the state. Um, we also uh, strive for the commitment of communication and we offer these kind of presentations to do some of that, uh, to open it up for questions or comments we allow for you to email us, um, you know, or call or whatever you want, what's more appropriate for you uh, to communicate with us. That would be uh, best uh, for your situation. Um, we also encourage you to even reach out to Marcy or any of the other um, associations. If you have questions that you'd rather them presented to us, we're, we're happy to address them that way as well. Um, our third item of our commitments are consistency. And we're trying to be as consistent as we can with the way we apply the regulations to you um, and every other facility. So uh, it certainly challenges us on that when you, you have to. Um, there are processes in place to do that, the IDR process um, or administrative law review, if you you know would, would like to go that route. That's certainly your right and, and we respect that. Um, accurate reporting is something we're continuously working on to try to make sure that we re reflect what was stated or what we seen in the facility when we were there. Um, so again, that's something we're striving on as a commitment uh, as a team. And then our final item is continuous education. This, and especially in, with the COVID-19 issues out in our public throughout our state, let alone throughout the world, um, continuing at, at continuous education is something that always challenges every one of us to stay on top and uh, with COVID-19, it's been really a, a crazy um, learning curve to try to get everything to know everything that we should know. So we're hoping we'll help you a little bit with what we know today. And maybe you can even share some of the things that you've experienced as well. So those are our team commitments and we hold ourselves to those. Uh, for an agenda for today, we have some one question we did receive we'll address. Um, we were going to give you some information on the survey status, ongoing survey updates that we're doing right now, and some of the results that we've seen. Uh, some of the CMP funds available out there that um, I still would encourage you to apply for. Uh, there's a newer one that's out there as well for communication devices. We'll talk a little bit about. Some of you have already taken advantage of that. The QSO memos that I think are important that you should know right now. Um, and then specifically, Q 
QSO memo 2029 uh, that just came out on COVID-19 reporting and what that means to you. Uh, then the blanket waivers, which are pretty critical to understand and, and know they're there for your use. And then any additional questions that you may have if we have time. Um, so the first question that we had that came in was, a, I think it was a leftover from the last presentation we did. Uh, came in late after we finished or close to the day we, we were ready to go. Um, but it asked about the requirements of participation for stage three. Um, uh, phase three is what I would call it, that CMS is putting out um, that came out in October of 2019 uh, that dealt with the number of the final phase of the upgrade to all the re regulations for long-term care. Um, and so they were asking at this point, at this time, um, are we surveying to them uh, and what to expect, I guess, in, in general. Uh, right now, we haven't heard anything additional from CMS. They did originally hold us back on some of those phase three regulations. And so I've just today re requested additional information from them and they still have no decision on phase three requirements at this time. I think in the past I explained that we not only do we not um, have the, the regulations in our computer system, and the tool that CMS is having us use, but um, you know we've not been briefed on anything else in any direction CMS is going with them. So it's still in limbo um, at this point. And so again, I will go over, and I think when we get to the survey status, it'll kind of help a little bit explain what surveys we are focusing on. So that's the next one, survey status. Um, this QSO memo, memo came out uh, March 23rd and it talks about prior, prioritization of our survey activities. And fundamentally, these are what we are surveying, immediate jeopardies for complaints or facility reported incidents uh, are the surveys we're conducting uh, as an, an emergent, that's our primary. Secondary are these targeted infection control surveys. And we have started some of them, we've been in the field for the last two weeks. We'll have an additional two more weeks that will be out um, for those in targeted infection control surveys. And they are just that, they are infection control reviews. Um, however, if we did see something that is immediate jeopardy level in the facility, we could start addressing that different issue, um, you know, as an immediate jeopardy and go through that process. So, uh, and then the final one that we're allowed to do at this time under CMS guidance is initial certification. So any new providers, which we have some rural health clinics right now, but nothing in long-term care. Um, I guess the closest potential would be the uh, state uh, veterans home down in the Butte area. So, and that will be starting soon. So that would be another one we could, we could do at this point if we needed to. Um, what we will not be surveying is um, we are not doing health surveys, uh, life safety code or emergency preparedness standard surveys right now. Um, no long-term care, no hospitals, no home health, no hospices. Um, again, it had all, these would all change if we had an immediate jeopardy in one of these other facility types, if it was a hospice or a home health, or even one of the hospitals or critical access hospitals. So. Uh, again, it'd have to be at the highest level of media jeopardy uh, type complaint or facility reported incident. Um, and no revisits for previously started surveys. So if we uh, were, had done a survey and we had exited and it was not, you know, it was just a standard uh, recertification survey, we have not been going back to um, do the revisits and CMS has approved that in the sense of, you know, stopping the clock for you as a provider as well, as far as no uh, denial of payment for new admissions and um, uh, those kind of enforcement activities. Uh, I did hear today or have seen some information that CMS is working on draft guidance for a restart of the surveys. I don't know how soon that's gonna happen. 
uh, CMS has been non-committal to us as to tell us when that will occur or even if they're thinking about it. But I seen a, it was an article in the Washington Journal, I think, that stated that they were at least drafting things to start restart surveys. When that is, I have no clue. Um, we did meet with CMS yesterday on the telephone as well. Uh, had no committal there as far as when they said things are going to go be reopened and restarted. So, um, and the one good indicator of that to let us know that it's going to continue is that they have given this um, CMP, CMP money, and I'll explain that for communicative devices. So um, I'll go on to that. That's the next item, um, use of civil monetary penalty uh, fees that have been paid in. Um, this is a new one for communicative, communicative technology requests form. There's a form on this uh, website I, I list here for you. That's the quickest way to get to it. It's, it is a state web, website. Um, once you complete the form, you submit it to Baranda Lydell and there's her phone number and her email address directly. Um, Shonda Hildebrand normally handles a lot of these CMP requests and things, but she's having uh, Baranda help uh, manage this so they can turn it around quickly. Um, so I'm aware of, of them turning them around within three to five days. Uh, we've had 16 facilities that I counted as of yesterday. I think there's been another three that have been awarded some so far. So these are all long-term care uh, specific um, CMP awards uh, for use of these uh, communicative technology devices. And, and what CMS has, has stated is what you can use these for or use this money for, um, and I believe there's an upper limit of $3,000, um, but it does say there are some, there can be some excep exceptions, so you'd have to work through that, but the type of devices they're talking about is iPads or iPad minis, Amazon Echoes, Kindle Fire, Microsoft Surfaces, Samsung Galaxy Tablets, um, Facebook Portal, or any other device that that you think may work for your facility better than others. So um, they also allow you to procure um, with that money protective covers that can be cleaned and disinfected, assistive adaptive equipment, tripods for floor table tops, headphones, and tablet cleaning and disinfection products that are in accordance with the manufacturer's uh, recommendations of the device manufacturer. So anyhow, those those are things you should uh, look into if you're interested in. It may help with some of this um, non-communal dining and, and um, being able to have visitations as well through uh, via the web or um, some other kind of uh, electronic device. So uh, good one to look at. The other thing I wanted to add here, or the, the, the final thing, whoops, let me go back. Um, the final thing on that particular item is that they do require receipts or invoices after uh, for approval for reimbursement. So the way I understand it is um, you're approved and then you purchase the material and then you re re uh, submit a re uh, invoice or receipt to show what you purchased and then it's you know reimbursed at that point. So um, if you have questions, I would reach out to Baranda Lydell and ask her um, anything specifically you have on that specific CMP use. Um, otherwise, any of the CMP funding requests that you have for just general um, review by the state and by uh, Senior Long-Term Care uh, Division, which is under uh, Shonda Hildebrand, um, you can get those all in by September 30th of 2020 is the next review. Uh, I think just today they sent on the ones they've, from our uh, review here within the Department of Public Health to CMS for consideration. So they're reviewing the ones that came in in March 30th, I guess it was, 31st, uh, whatever. The, the last day of March and the last day of September is when you have to have those in by to receive any reimbursement. So going on to uh, this portion, I'm gonna let Tina chime in and, and address these specific, I think the next three slides. 
Okay, so can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so for the targeted infection control surveys that we've been doing, they've actually been going extremely well, which we're pretty darn pleased about that. Thank you out there to everybody who's participating in those. We do know it takes a bit of time to do them, but it is appreciated. So the few trends that we've noticed so far is that some of the facilities are requiring staff to use PPE in certain ways when there is not positive or presumed cases of COVID-19 in the facility. And I'm talking about having them have to use um, N95s and masks and gowns and things that you typically would not see if there is not current cases in the facility or anybody in isolation that's being monitored is what's happening is then those staff have become a little complacent in the use of their PPE and not necessarily following the proper procedures. So that is definitely one thing facilities want to take a look at to make sure that whatever PPE they're using, that staff are using them appropriately. The other thing surveys identified in a couple of facilities is facilities not assessing staff, visitors, and residents appropriately for the signs and symptoms of COVID, and then documenting as necessary. And the third thing we have is the failure to implement and maintain social distancing for communal dining. And that's where you're looking at both staff and residents being involved. So just residents being too close together or communal dining still occurring without any changes in the environment have taken place where you have multiple residents sitting close together at a dining table. The last thing that we have is that facility policies and procedures have not really been either looked at, updated, or there's a start of a development related to COVID-19. So we will not cite facilities for not having a policy, but CMS does recommend that you go in and you start taking a look at this because it's gonna be an ongoing issue, they suspect. So it for sure is something a facility is gonna to wanna to start addressing if you haven't already done that. On the next slide, thank you. Um, for the past and current surveys for the focused infection control that we're doing right now, the, the ones that are actually open, so I'm talking about surveys that if we're going out right now and we're doing a complaint survey or we're doing a focused infection control survey, or for surveys that were prior to all of this COVID stuff happening, if you had a survey open, the plan of corrections need to be sent in if you were cited at your facility. They need to be sent in timely in the EPOC system. And then is what happens is we go in, we check to make sure they're received, we check to make sure they're timely, but then unfortunately we can't really do anything else with it because of our work restrictions. So you are required though to carry out the actions of the plan of correction and prevent further deficient practice from occurring. And then when we do do the revisits, we will verify through your documentation and interviews or observations if we're on site that those actions were carried out in a timely manner as you stated they would be on your plan of correction. When the restrictions start to get lifted, we will then go in and we will schedule any revisits and we will complete the POC reviews as we're allowed to do that. Right now, we cannot conduct any revisits even if you have an immediate jeopardy situation um, where you would remove that immediate jeopardy and your severity and scope would be lowered, we won't even do a revisit on those. So everything is basically on hold as far as revisits are concerned. Um, next slide, please. Todd, can you advance the slide for me?
Todd. Oh, thanks. Um, for the infection control assessments, a couple of things that we noticed, and these are the ones that the governor has requested the facilities complete and send them in. Um, they're very similar to the ICAR assessments. So we only have four areas that we've identified as a trend, and we have approximately 50% of the facilities in Montana who have completed all of these assessments. And again, thank you very much for helping out on these because it's really beneficial. And we have identified a couple of really good things that have helped facilities work on. So hopefully when they do have a survey, it would prevent any concerns with deficient practice. So these four areas include lack of knowledge on the cleaning of cloth masks and gowns, lack of knowledge on injection practices and needle sticks policy, the antibiotic stewardship program either not being in place or not currently active and being used or maintained, and then the inability to obtain PPE. Now, just as a reminder, we will not cite a facility if you do not have appropriate PPE, but you have to show the surveyors that you're using multiple ways to try and get that PPE, and you want to really work to mitigate the problem that you have and do as much as you can to prevent the spread of infection. But really, if you show us you're mitigating and you show us you're attempting to get the PPE consistently as needed, and I don't mean like one time, I mean show us consistently that you're trying to get it, you will not receive a citation for that. So that's something that we will not do. And next slide, please. Todd, do you want me to keep going on these? Uh, no, Tina, I'll take over from here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So going back one here, if I can get us back there. Here we go. Okay, so one of the QSO memos that uh, CMS have issued uh, that has changed actually three different times is this QSO 20-14, and it's specific to nursing homes, uh, guidance and infection control. The revision you wanna look at is March 13th, 2020. Um, this gives you some guidance, and, and this is probably one that we've had, at least I have had quite a few questions on based on the visitation requirements and communal dining and group activities. And so I'll go through this a little bit and explain um, why well, I think this is important to know what's there and what, what's in it. Um, this does, some of the questions that have come in uh, with visitation talks about, or uh, we've had is, um, you know, what is appropriate. And CMS does allow for, uh, you know, for uh, uh, end of life type scenarios to have visitation come in. If a person's on hospice in your facility, and at the end of their, you know, their life, um, this is one way to allow, you know, those folks to come in and visit during that time. Uh, however, they still have to follow the infection protocols and they still would have to be screened to review them to make sure they're not bringing in um, COVID if they don't have the symptoms and signs and et cetera. So it is your um, obligation to, you know, review those folks as they come in to that, uh, uh, into your facility and make sure they're not um, bringing anything in for any of the other residents. Um, the communal dining and group activities uh, pretty much have been canceled and I know a lot of you that puts a lot more stress on you as far as how do you do these things, how do you um, puts more uh, certainly more on you for feeding and and meals and things like that and, and then also to keep them uh, somewhat of social activities or some activities going on to keep them somewhat uh, entertained. Um, so again, these are areas that you'll have to work on. Again, I think that uh, CMP money that is out there, I would encourage you to take advantage of that to procure some of these uh, communicative, communicative devices to even allow you to do some of that for the residents. Um, uh, again, I remind you about the screening of residents and staff and to make sure your staff are um, good each day as they come in. If they go to lunch, they come back in the facility, they should be screened as well um, to make sure they're okay. 
Um, and then opportunities for other types of visits with residents. It does describe some of that. Um, we've had questions come in about, well, can we host a drive-by, you know, from the front of the facility to for family residents to come by and, and just visit um, uh, but from their car and wave and whatnot. And um, CMS has not given us specific guidance on that, but uh, certainly that is something the liability is in your hands. You, you decide what works best for you um, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. You, you know, it's, it's kind of open at this point, how you wanna approach that. Um, visitors uh, come in. The other thing I would add with that, what I just stated about the, you know, the uh, driving and, and coming by and visiting and that kind of thing, or uh, even communicating through windows is you also want to respect the requirements of the state, uh, the governor's office as well, and any of the restrictions he's put on us all as uh, citizens of the state. So uh, think of those as well. Um, and then um, again, if they, a reminder that if the visitors come in, they must be, um, they, they should be reminded to self-monitor for COVID-19 after they leave too. If they start having symptoms you know, a couple days after they go, they should let you know um, and get in communication with you to let you understand that uh, at least they may have some or may, they may have developed it since they left. Um, so those are the, the one memo I think you should pay attention to. It also talks about transferring a residence um, and then what, how to accept a resident from a COVID-19 from a hospital. It kind of goes through the different scenarios there. Um, and then it talks again about on this one about will nursing homes be cited for not having appropriate supplies. And again, like Tina reminded you, as long as you're trying to obtain it and if you're having a difficult time obtaining it, uh, they're uh, not asking us to cite anything as long as you're, you're making uh, you know, efforts to do that. So um, the next QSO memo is 20-25 that talks about transfer scenarios specifically. And this one kind of lays out um, the basics uh, and introduces cohorting of COVID-19 positive or quarantined uh, admits to kind of uh, put them in a, an area that they can be quarantined and separated from those folks that are non-positive or, or uh, not, you know, have been in the facility for a number of, of years and show no symptoms and whatnot. So they give you three examples of the transfer scenarios. Um, one is for two long-term facilities to cohort residents. In other words, two um, certified facilities decide, hey, um, you have a, an extra wing over here on this building that we could use to isolate people. We're gonna just transfer our residents over there to yours and you can send any um, that you, from that wing or whatnot to us and we can work together to kind of segregate and cohort those that are, are potential or who have the COVID-19. The second one is to um, sending your COVID residents, positive residents to a non-certified location. One of the caveats with this is they say that the state must approve that location. Um, so if you have questions about this or concerned or considering this, let us know and we can help you with that part of it, how to to make sure it meets the state qualification or requirements, I should say, for those uh, alternative locations. Um, the third example is a COVID-19 residents uh, that are sent to a federally operated or a state run facility. Um, example would be like FEMA operating a facility. The other one I think is the Army Corps of Engineer. Um, there is no re reimbursement to the long-term care facility, however, if that's the case. I'm aware of some facilities that are being put together to accommodate some of this, um, not necessarily for right now, but if we needed it in the future. Um, so there are some things being worked on to try to create some of those opportunities to transfer to a COVID positive um, location. So this is a good one to keep in mind if you, you know, something occurs if somebody does get COVID in your, your facility, then, then you have some options here to kind of transfer and segregate your folks. So um, moving on to 20-26, uh, it talks about 
a warning of, it was really a warning to you about reporting of the COVID-19 in your facility on a weekly basis. Um, for Montana, you're going to report it to your local health departments in the facility. And in what CMS has provided for us is to state that you must do it either to the local or state or, and state health departments. Again, for Montana, the local health departments are adequate because then they do get with the state health department and work with them and, and look at the reporting. Um, I've given you a link directly to do that in how you report on a, on a local level. Uh, it gives you the name and number, and I believe they have 24-hour numbers, so if you had something occur on a Saturday evening or even at midnight, they've got um, folks to, to respond to any kind of uh, reporting requirements there for COVID-19. Um, so that's really, and, and then it was warning you also about this uh, 2029 that's coming out, and I'll cover that in a minute, about then reporting on an, a national level to uh, a national network, and I'll, I'll kind of go over that as well here shortly. Hey, Todd. Uh, yes. There was a question in the chat box about to fulfill the requirement of COVID-19 reporting to NHSN, can you tell me how far back we should enter data or what the starting point is? Okay, um, yeah, the question, that's a good question. Um, I think the earlier, or the, if you look in the guidance on, and I'll just go to it so we, the question's right fresh in our minds. Um, it does state in here, it gives guidelines as to what CMS's expect, expectation is, is that everyone should be able to do that reporting. Uh, right now they're given a two week grace period. And so you can start reporting as soon as you're registered and you're ready to go, but no later than 11.59 um, p.m. on May 24th, 2020. So that's uh, Sunday, it's a Sunday um, night. So up until that point, you don't have to report if, you know, or if you're capable, go ahead and do it. If not, it doesn't matter. Then they're going to start looking at the reporting data uh, the third week or after the third week on May 31st. Um, at, again, and that 31st, I think, is a Sunday as well. Yes. So, um, so then, then they describe what they're going to do. They're going to um, give warning letters to remind them to begin reporting at that time if you didn't by May 31st. Um, for facilities that have not started reporting by 11.59 p.m. on June 7th, which again, I think is a Sunday. Yep. Um, ending the fourth week of reporting, CMS will impose a per day CMP of $1,000 for one day for failure. So they've got some enforcement action they're going to uh, put in place. So I hope that addresses the question. Um, I'll try to go back here to this 26 and kind of finish with it, and then we'll move on to 29, uh, that's the QSO that you're speaking of. Um, so going on with uh, 2026, warning of reporting requirements about COVID-19, um, the resident and resident representative reporting requirements. This is something that uh, the state survey agency would look at, you know, if there was a COVID issue in a facility specifically. And I'll go over that in 2029 as well. But so the requirements are within 12 hours of occurrence of a single confirmed infection of COVID-19. And this is uh, communicating with the residents, resident representatives and, and families as, as you get into this a little bit more, it tells you that as well. Um, and then it also requires this, if you had three or more residents or staff with new onset after the initial of respiratory symptoms that occur within 72 hours. So those are the reporting requirements that they put in place. Um, then continued reporting is weekly updates. So you have to enter these weekly at a minimum. Um, and then if you had a new resident or staff with new onset of respiratory symptoms, you wanna put those in the day you know, the day you know of it. Um, and then, and or three or more residents or staff within new onset occurs within 72 hours. So you just wanna keep them up to date as soon as you know um, to give them that information so they understand what the situation is in your facility. Uh, 
this 2029, this next QSO memo, gives a, a additional detail. And it was kind of the guidance that uh, they said they would give after 2026. So um, again, here, I'm gonna just summarize that F884 uh, is a, are gonna look at this F884 deficiency is gonna focus on um, a failure to report or the, the, the compliance of, of reporting. It'll be to this National Health Service Network and they provide that in, um, in this, again, 2029. We are not really involved with this, so we can't really tell you how they're doing it, how it's going about. It's done pretty much directly with CMS. Um, I did put down here in the bottom, if there's questions, there's a point of contact um, to email things into. So I'd encourage you to ask them about that specifically. Um, and I started to kind of talk about this two-week two grace period that ends on 1159 on May 24th. So again, that's the really the time you want to aim for to get to start reporting the data. Uh, with the first real draw of data, May 31st, 2020. So um, so then the other part of this, this F884 is not written by us as a survey agency in Montana. It will be written by the feds um, on a federal level and we'll be out of the loop on that. But they'll, they'll take care of that part of it based on you know, their databases and what they're seeing and what they're not seeing. Uh, the one we will look at is if 885, failure to report to residents, again, representatives and families. Uh, so we will write these deficiencies if, you know, again, it, it would, as you know, um, immediate jeopardy is going to draw us into the facility. Um, you know, uh, and that would be a complaint or facility reported incident. Uh, so we're going to continue to do our infection, targeted infection control surveys. Um, and so this won't be an effective, in fact, in effect, I don't believe until uh, that they fully implement this is my understanding to where we would look at a failure to report. If you had a, a COVID case, that's going to bring on a new, new different uh, set of challenges. And um, we'll look at, we will look at, you know, how are the residents reported to uh, representatives and families, uh, how are they notified? So again, if you have questions on that um, National Health Service Network, I think this is the best point of contact for you at this point is this um, DNH triage team at cms.hhs.gov. So the other thing you'll see in this uh, 2029 is they give you the COVID-19 focus survey for nursing homes. That, and it almost looks, it looks very similar to what we call the, um, oh, their uh, modules put in the new long-term care survey process um, that give you, you know, direction on, or give our surveyors direction on how they should look through things, what questions they should ask. Um, and the name escapes me at this point, but, um, oh, critical element pathways, ex excuse me, that's what they are. And anyhow, um, it gives you the step-by-step -step infection control process the surveyors are using right now as they come in the facility, although there's no COVID-19. Um, but these are using, we're using these for focused, focused or targeted uh, infection control surveys that are being conducted throughout the state. So uh, the only difference in this edition of it is they did add the two reporting requirements of um, reporting to residents, uh, as I mentioned, that's the part that we would enforce reporting to residents and under section seven of that um, particular checklist. And that would be in place if there's uh, COVID in the facility. Um, then going on, uh, the other portion again is, is number eight that is specifically to CMS and it's done offsite by them. So we wouldn't even look at that portion of it. Uh, so that's kind of the changes for that, the 2029. Is there any questions specific to that one that I can address? Hey, Chad. 
Yes. There was a specific question about if you are a CA with long-term care residents in their beds, are they required to report the data to NHSN? I don't believe they are because they're not under, if you look at this 2029 nursing home, it's specific to nursing homes. It's not, it doesn't say nursing home and CA, it says nursing home. So the regulation or the guidance, the QSO, is specific to long-term care. And then Todd, this is Marcy. I just had a question back to the NHSN entry. So it doesn't specify, it just says, uh, because it does say that facilities are, are to start entering on May 17th, but it doesn't say retroactively how far to go back. Do they begin at that point in time? You know, to me, they would. It doesn't say you have to go backwards and, and start entering it. Okay, so just the tail end of this question, can we report weekly and be safe? For example, 511 to 514 has been entered today, and then on Monday, we can enter data for 515 through 521, enter retrospectively for the last seven days. Yes, I, I would agree they could. Um, CMS is going to start to pull data, you know, after the third week um, and, and start looking to see if anybody, if some folks are not reporting. So, um, you know, that's the way I look at it. And again, if you have specifics, I would send them to this DNH um, triage team. Uh, and, and there is actually on here an enforcement part too if you want to know what, what they're going to enforce. Um, good question for them. Do you by chance know the turnaround time? Are they getting through those pretty quickly or do you have any idea what folks are looking at? I do not, but um, I'd be curious to hear from the providers too to say, is it difficult to get on? You know, is it difficult to register folks for this or your facility for it? So. I don't know. We're not, again, we're not directly involved with it. So we don't, you know, we don't have really any data. I can certainly ask that of CMS and, and see and get a result, uh, get some kind of result and share it with you as to what they're indicating. And we do have several other questions in chat. So um, did you want to go on to the waivers and then we'll go back and go through them, Todd, or? No, we can address the questions. That's fine. Okay. Um, let me just start at the top. And I think just for those on the phone who aren't seeing the chat, there was a question saying, I'm looking at uh, input regarding feasibility, flexibility that would allow residents to visit with their family members if they were to conduct the visit outside with social distancing and supervised by a staff member. And Tina did respond, um, and then a follow-up to that was uh, there's a family member who is preparing to contact the Montana Congressional Delegation and the State Survey Agency because they're not allowing them to have at least an outdoor visit, and so we'd appreciate any advice or support. Okay. Um, you know, it's hard for us to see at this point on the visitation, the CMS has really laid it out in their guidance. Um, and again, it, to me, it comes down to liability of the facility. Are they willing to take that liability on? Um, and, and let's be um, straightforward about it. It's liability for all of us. And no matter what we do today in life with uh, the COVID-19 issue, um, you know, by uh, doing some of these things, it can create uh, exposures uh, to infections if they're there or not, uh, or if they're there. Uh, so it's a challenge to say what's the right thing to do, what's not. We were hoping for more guidance from CMS about this, but we've not received anything additional um, as far as, you know, these outside um, visits or visits through a window. Um, I, you know, again, I, I would just res uh, request that you respect the the social distancing requirements of the state that the governor has put out as well, and that um, you know you follow the the CDC guidelines as far as um, infection control for staff and residents and and how you you would do that. 
uh, it could it cause a, a complaint? Absolutely. Um, you know, we could get a complaint that number one, they won't let us in the facility. Um, to be honest, would we triage that as a IJ? No. Um, we could get a complaint though that we were, you know, we did get in the facility and we were exposed and now we have COVID-19 and now it's spreading around um, our family or whatever. So there's that as well to consider. And um, if it's, if it is COVID specific, it's something that we're most likely going to get involved with um, to come out and do surveys. So I, I don't know, that's not a direct answer, but that's the best I can give at this point is how we would look at it. Um, we share in your frustration of how, how to do this, how to make it occur. Um, and also protect your staff and protect your residents in the facility. Still, you know, increase the socialized, socialization, excuse me, of... Oh, yeah, we you cut out there a little bit. Uh, the socialization of uh, your residents, so... And then there was also a question at the tail end of that. Uh, will the state be issuing 2567s for a telephone infection control survey? No. Okay, let me just head down the list here. Yes, yeah, so Tina did uh, bring that up a little bit for further discussion. And then can you share the CMS web address to easily access the QSO memos? Uh, sure, I'll do it at the end here or give it to Marcy and send it out. I know there was a way to join it at one point to get those QSOs and I'll, I'll attempt to get that again. I did not receive a response last time from them, but I'll try it again and see, because I know there's an email list you can get on where it automatically comes to you or they notify you that there's been a you know, state or a QSO issued. So let me work on that. And okay, so if I, if we don't see that in the chat, just send to me and I will go ahead and forward that on. Sounds good. Everybody, okay. Let's see, and then I think we hit the COVID on how far back data needs to be reported. Next question, are you recommending rescreening anytime a staff member goes outside the building and then returns? You know, I, <laughs> That's certainly up to you how you want to handle it. It does state that you must screen people as they come in and out of the building. Um, you don't know where they've went to for lunch or whatever. Um, they may have just went out for a smoke break, but we all know it. Sometimes people have friends come in and visit them or family and may meet them outside or whatever, uh, and then go back in the facility. You want to be cautious about that, about screening them as they come back in and, and back and forth. I know when we were up at one of the facilities that we um, did a survey in, we were going in and out um, and we were checking temperatures as we went out or as we went, as we came back in, excuse me, um, part of the policy of the, of the provider. So we followed their requirements. Um, so certainly you're, you, you need to do what you need to do um, and prevent that COVID from coming in your facility. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then do you have any guidance for uh, long-term care if hospitals want to transfer non-COVID patients from there to long-term cares? Um, the only thing that I would, I, and I believe it's addressed in here, is that you should consider um, quarantining if you have to, those folks as they come in, uh, just because um, it's almost like somebody coming from another facility or another state, whatever. Uh, let's see if it, it, it talks about this. It does talk about it in this QSO, I think 2014, when it talks about accepting a resident who is, oh no, that's for not. It says for those uh, nursing homes should admit any individuals that they would normally admit to their facility, including individuals from hospitals where a case of COVID was, is present. Also, if possible, dedicate a wing unit exclusively for residents coming or returning from the hospital. This can serve as a step down unit where, the remain, where they remain for 14 days with no symptoms. 
instead of integrating as usual a short-term rehab floor or returning to long stay original room. So I know at different points in this, I did see where folks coming back into the facility should be monitored, especially if there's a COVID case in the facility they went to, if it's a hospital, ambulatory surgical center, whatever it is, um, you still wanna kind of screen for them. Let me look a little bit more on that and provide um, you know, a little more detailed response to see what CMS or CDC has specific for that. Because I don't want you to overdo it if you don't need to, if it's not a absolute requirement for 14 day isolation, so. Okay, and again, you can just get that to me, Todd, and I'll shoot it back out, that would be great. Sounds good. Okay, and then the next question, please explain the review process that was put out to facilities regarding the governor's infection control assessment. Review by the state agency of those assessments and follow up with facilities to assist facilities with compliance. Also the timelines between the infection control assessment, follow up feedback to facilities and the infection control focus surveys. Okay, so for those um, and the ones that the governor asked, those were strictly voluntary. Um, they came, you know, it was sent out to all long-term care facilities to participate in it. And once we got them, we started to review them. And if we had any questions or any concerns, they, the surveyors would contact the facility directly and kind of address any of those questions they had as, as a reviewer. Um, and so that's how it started. In the meantime, um, CMS had pushed us pretty hard to get out into the facilities to start doing these targeted infection control reviews. And they were based on if a facility had a um, infection control F880 deficiency written in the last two federal fiscal years. So federal fiscal year 2018 and 2019. Um, so that's how we based the current list of how we're reviewing facilities um, and how we're picking those that we're doing the focused or targeted infection control surveys. Okay. And then thanks, Tina. She is uh, helping me tag team this chat, so that's great. Okay, let's see. I uh, have been unable to get into the reporting. I can't attach myself to the facility after five emails going back and forth. It is still not resolved. Well, uh, again, uh, if it sounds like you're using the email that they provided, that's the best I can tell you. If you want to drop me an email, I can let them know um, of your struggles or let somebody else in CMS know of the struggles with it, higher up in their management and see if we can get some resolve for you. Or let Marcy know, um, it doesn't matter. Um, just so we can uh, see if we can help. Okay, and then I see where Pam um, Webb, you might wanna chime in too, Pam. So she's asking, you know, if the facility's already enrolled in NHSN, um, if your facility NHSN administrator can add you as a user, as a user uh, you should be able to access the long-term care module uh, and that is as long as you have a SAMS card. So I'm not too sure Brenna has if her facility is enrolled or not, but I will also add that we have set up uh, just within the last day or so a plan to do some open office hour calls on the next three Mondays. So the first one is going to be May 18th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon where it's just a brief presentation by uh, our data analyst just talking about NHSN and really to kind of field questions like this and help you out. So just look for that notice coming out and uh, Brenna, Pam and I can try and get with you to see if we can help you on that. And let's see, CDC guidance on screening states, actively screen anyone entering the building healthcare provider, ancillary staff, vendors, consultants for fever and symptoms of COVID-19 before starting each shift. Send ill personnel home. Is our state team recommending a different practice and expanding that to include staff exit entering after their initial screening? So it kind of ties into that 
Well, and uh, Marcy, to address that, we are not recommending anything beyond what's, you're, if you're following CDC, you're okay. On, this is Tina. On one of the calls we had, um, this is probably about, gosh, I'd say a month or so ago, they were talking about something similar and they had stated that one of the concerns they have is if staff are going out to restaurants and things like that and picking up food or going to the grocery store, um, doing some of those tasks that they just basically need to do on their lunch hours or on their extended breaks or if you have individuals that are taking people like doctor's appointments and stuff like that um, that you may want to do and that's where they're recommending your rescreening when they're coming back just to make sure that they're not having any issues um, but those individuals would still be considered I guess on their same shift but is what they're saying is you want to take that into consideration. The guidance hasn't been changed though, as far as the screening is concerned. Thanks, Tina. And then just back to the um, recommendation about the hospital readmits. Uh, can you recite the 14-day recommendation? Or is that the question, Todd, that you're going to look into yeah, and provide us a little detail? Yeah, that's the question I think we need to look into and provide better guidance. Okay, so we'll just have everyone hang tight on that. Um, just a few more. If you are meeting a family member at the door to exchange items for a resident, if they put the items down and you do not come in contact with them, do you need to screen again? Uh, that's a good question. I, and then certainly I can see it happening on a daily basis. Um, again, I, you know, you don't know where you're going to get it from at this point. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I'd have to look at the CDC. I don't think they address that specifically. Okay. So hey, we'll Todd. have you look that if you oh go ahead hi this is pam webb i just wanted to jump in is it reasonable hey, todd to think about and tina to think about you know the incubation period for covid is like two to 14 days um so if they're going out for lunch or going out to the grocery store and then they're coming back like say they're doing that during their lunch hour they've already been screened it doesn't it doesn't seem reasonable that you'd screen them again because the that would be just like one hour. So sure. that's, I guess that's something to think about, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, that's why I, say, I think we need to look into it further and give you some, you know, what we can find as far as um, if CDC provides anything. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Otherwise, I could see everybody um, screening. Screening could go, could go overboard a little bit, but... Sure, absolutely. But that's a good, thank you for your info. Okay, Marcy, okay. are you ready to go on or? Um, well, there's a couple more questions. Uh, Todd had mentioned how they have provided feedback in a way of recommendation versus the facilities that are receiving a citation through a survey. Why the difference? Again, the, the reason we started doing the control or targeted infection control surveys is that request of CMS, and it was based on prior citations for the last two federal fiscal years. Um, so that's their direction for us to do. Um, so it's heads up if you've had some infection control tags, deficiencies in the last two years, most likely you're gonna have an, a targeted infection control survey. Uh, the CMS has also sent uh, for the last two weeks, um, a contractor to do some of those surveys themselves as well. So we've had a person here in the state doing reviews for infe targeted infection control surveys for I think seven facilities right now. So, Again, the pressure was to get us out in the field 
and to review for um, infection control. So that is why we then um, started picking up those targeted infection control surveys. Okay, and just uh, another comment, and I think Pam kind of addressed this previously uh, in that discussion, uh, confused about the incubation period uh, is two to 14 days, so the exposure to lunch break would obviously not show on the second screening. Uh, and then just uh, last one, uh, recommendations on staff self-screening versus having another staff member screen and this person is asking because uh, they can see staff members inaccurately recording temps based on personal needs. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I, that's a tough one to directly re answer. Um, you know, the, again, it's if there is a COVID outbreak in the facility, that's going to trigger, at least in my mind, a review by the federal CMS folks and CDC, if not, um, you know, as us as a state agency as well, if we're directed to do so. Okay, and that's the last question. I know we're at the three o'clock mark, but did you want to quickly go through the information on waivers, Todd? And if folks want need to drop off, they certainly can. I don't know if you I all talked. I can. There's quite a bit here with the blanket waivers. Um, and you know, even if you want to schedule another call, we could do that if it's something we could do next week or week after. Um, but I'll cover what I can right now. Um, so going on, uh, latest edition of this is 5-11-2020. Uh, they, they keep updating this blanket waiver. I've given you the easiest way that I could find it on a regular basis. Um, it's not always easy to find it. Some of the fundamentals of this are, it is retroactive back to March 1st of 2020. It will remain in place, these, all these different blanket waivers, until, public, until the public health emergency is ended. Um, CMS does not require uh, to be notified. They don't ha you don't have to call them and ask them or you don't have to let us know. Um, the only thing there is, you'll see some hold points at times in here uh, that has to be, it has to be state approved or whatnot. So if you get to one of those where you're going to start, and I'll give you an example, if you were going to use an alternative uh, uh, non-licensed or non-certified facility to overflow COVID patients into, um, they do ask that you check with your state and make sure it meets certain requirements. Uh, certainly we're not the one doing that at this point, but we can certainly get you in the right direction to get you some help to make sure it's, it's state approved. Um, uh, so anyhow, the blanket waivers cover a variety of things like the three day prior hospitalization requirement. They have waived that portion of it. Um, there's quite a bit here to this document. Um, so what I'll do- yeah, Todd, this, Maybe it would be better to just go over the blanket waivers since there's so much information in another okay. meeting if you're willing to do that. Absolutely. Um, we're, you know, I'm open to whatever. Um, we could do this. There's quite a bit of information here. There's a lot of changes and things and trying to understand what they're trying to tell you. They're waiving. I will kind of uh, add that they did add some new things on here um, since their last posting of it. And some of those are uh, they talk about paid feeding assistance and they used to require a minimum or we did you know the federal reg required a minimum of eight hours for them now they've reduced it to a minimum of one hour in length um, which is probably good as well for folks especially with the non-communal dining dining and then um, i don't remember if there's something other specific there is some things on life safety code as well that it has reduced um, again, since their last release on 4.30 of 2020, um, they talk about alcohol-based hand rub dispensers and how much, you know, the, they've released some of those requirements to allow for more of those to uh, occur in the facility. The other ones I would mention is fire drills. 
they're not making the ma mandatory quarterly fire drills that actually go through a mass, you know, or move uh, staff going through the paces. Um, they're looking at a documented orientation training program for that. Uh, they also re re relieved um, some temporary construction requirements. Uh, so it would allow for temporary walls and barriers between patients if needed um, for isolation and things like that. So those are the three that I think that are pretty, or some that are pretty interesting right now. The others, I can go on at a, at a later date and kind of go through them pretty in detail. Okay, why don't uh, you and I get together? Why don't you look at your schedule, Todd and Tina, and see Let's if you want to just do a follow-up to this next week. Okay, we'll give you a date if that's fine. That would be great. And then um, we do, do you want to take one more uh, question? There is one more question. Sure. In chat, so follow-up to the transfer of non-COVID patients from the hospital to the long-term care, does CMS have guidance regarding not quarantine patients who had a negative COVID test just before transfer? Basically, if a test was ruled out uh, COVID, could that patient go directly into the general population? And again, maybe this is gonna be, I know you're gonna look into that a little bit more, but do you wanna comment on that at all, Todd? Sure, um, it's a great question and I, it's something we will have to look at and make sure we're right before we tell you we don't want to misdirect you. And Todd, uh, this is Erica. Can I just give my two cents on the infection control side of things? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so with this, just remember a negative test is a snapshot in time. It's indicative that the person's negative at that point. It does not mean that during the incubation period, which is 14 days, that the individual will not become symptomatic and therefore could spread COVID-19. So something to just remember is when we are screening, that's that, that day they may be negative. It does not mean that tomorrow they won't become symptomatic and could spread. Thank you, Erica. Great point, thanks Erica, jumping in there. Okay, well, uh, let's just plan on blanket waivers next week. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Todd and Tina. And we will just let you know on a time next week. Sounds good. All right. Tina and Todd, this is Pam Webb. Thank you so much for your information. That's, you covered a lot. You guys are so smart. <laughs> thank you. It's, as we said, this is challenging time and uh, it's hard for us to, you know, to understand it as well as quickly as it's coming out. So we can only, you know, share that frustration of trying to interpret it and provide guidance on it. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Have thanks. a great rest of the day, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Certification Bureau, this is time.